Now, this is our final session of the day, um, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Salamisha Tile, uh, who is a Henry Rutgers Professor of African American and African Studies and Creative Writing at Rutgers University. Um, Salamisha is also a contributing at large uh, uh, um, editor here at the New York Times, um, a contributing critic at large, I should say, at the New York Times. Um, and she's going to lead the conversation, um, this final conversation, this afternoon. Um, and the topic of the conversation is where art and activism meet. So please welcome Salamisha and her speakers, who are Shimon Mejar, visual artist and music producer, founder and band leader of Bomba Estero. Um, we have Chai Suri, who's an indigenous climate activist and is absolutely terrific. Um, and we have Zoraida Lopez Diago, um, intersectional environmentalist, photographer, and curator. Please give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank everyone for joining the last session of Climate Forward New York. Um, it's been an invigorating day uh, full of conversations, debates, and potential solutions. And for our final discussion, we're having a topic that's really near and dear to my heart, uh, the relationship between art and activism um, and its role in inspiring kind of radical change in uh, a variety of social movements. Uh, so we're gonna be thinking about, of course, uh, environmental justice, um, the climate movement, um, indigenous rights, and racial justice, so, and feminist movements. So thinking about all of these things and the way in which they coexist, and they uh, inspire each other, and hopefully create a, a more equitable future for us all. Um, so we call this a conversation between artists and activists. But really, each of these uh, people on this wonderful panel are artists and activists. And it's a question of how you think about the relationship between the two is something I think we should talk about as well. So right here, I'm joined by uh, Simone Miha, who is a visual artist and music producer. Um, he's the founder of Bamba Asterio, an award-winning uh, Colombian band known for hit songs that mix traditional music and electronica. Um, Bombay Asteros album Deja was named best album of the year uh, in 2020 by the New York Times. Uh, <laughs> um, next we have uh, Zoraida Lopez Diago, who is an intersectional environmentalist, a photographer and curator. Uh, recently, Zoraida co curated the exhibition Picturing Black Girlhood Moments of Possibility and is the co-editor of Natural Lineage Photography and Representation, Another Way of Knowing, um, which is a collection of essays and images that reclaim the brilliance of black women. Um, she's also the co-founder of Conservationist of Color, uh, currently the director of Scenic Hudson River Cities program, and her new position soon, uh, later this fall, uh, she was recently appointed uh, Vice President of Communications and Strategic Partners, Partnerships at the Glenwood Center. Thank you, Zoraida. And next we have Chai uh, Surui, who is an indigenous activist and executive producer of the film Territory. Uh, for, her defending the, for her, defending the forest is a, a family issue, a political issue and a family issue. Uh, her father is the great chief of the Paiter uh, Surui people, and her mother is also an environmental activist. So uh, I would like to open this conversation broadly, and then we're going to become more specific and look at your actual uh, independent artworks. But first, the big question is, uh, why does art matter in your work in terms of uh, environmental issues? So what's the relationship between art and the environment for you? Or maybe even, how did you come to your work? For me? Yes, for everyone. But how did you come to, to doing this work this way? Um, well, well, first of all, thank you very much for being here, for sharing this conversation, for the times for inviting. I come from Colombia, 
I come from Colombia and, and the music that we've been making with the band for almost 20 years now um, has been inspired by the folk music from Colombia, mm. the first and main inspiration of our music, of Bomba City music, that is uh, contemporary music, is the folk music from Colombia. And so investigating around what was happening in the folk music in Colombia and going to the territories where that music happens, mm -hmm. that are territories that are inhabited by uh, minorities of the country, uh, originally by indigenous peoples, then by the African diaspora and the white people that came during the colonial times. And that mixture of, of, that, of those three cultures gave birth to the great folk music from Colombia that is represented mainly by cumbia music from the Caribbean that has taken the world. So going to those territories and, and, and speaking with those people and with the grandparents and with the masters of that music, I realized that the main inspiration for that music was nature, hmm. was bird singing, the sound of the rivers, the, the jungle, the sound of the animals. Colombia is the country with, with more diversity in birds in the world. Mm. So I assume that's why we have so many great singers mm. as well. No? <laughs> <laughs> so realizing that situation and realizing that those territories are actually threatened, mm -hmm. the Amazon jungle, um, the Pacific rainforest, the Andean mountain range with all the paramos and uh, where the water is, is born and the uh, the Llanos, the Caribbean and the Pacific Coast, all the ecosystems in Colombia that are really powerful because, because Colombia is and should be a world leader in, in nature, mm. is threatened mm -hmm. by many reasons, many reasons. And realizing that that ecosystems are, th are threatened means that music mm -hmm. is threatened as well. Mm. So it became kind of my homage to the music that inspired me in the first place should be to also talk about the protection and, and, and bring forward the discussion about the importance of protecting those ecosystems, is protect, protecting also the communities and the music that those communities make that has made Colombia a world leader in music as well. Mm. So it's kind of, we owe that mm. to nature. Mm. So it became a mission and speaking with indigenous leaders and Afro community leaders and everything, they, they just told me, you have a mission, man, go and do it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've been doing for the last six years through music and through documentary filmmaking and through everything I do, I try to relate it with this, mm -hmm. with this particular and very special situation that happens in Colombia that makes it so unique. Mm. Thank you. So right, how did you come to this, to this work? Um, I grew up with, um, a mother who actually headed up affirmative action for State of Connecticut Environmental uh, Protection Agency and Parks. So we sat around the kitchen table talking about the intersection of social justice and um, the environment and nature, who has access to nature and who doesn't have access to nature and who is made to feel comfortable in spaces and who, um, often is the most impacted by climate change. And when I started making art, um, there was kind of uh, no way that the process of me making art and thinking about art could be removed from those conversations that I really grew up having and that has impacted my work in the labor movement and um, land conservation and land rights and in my art too. Chai? So uh, I'm born I'm indigenous, so I'm born fighting, fighting for my life, for the forest, mm -hmm. and the environmental. And in the past, uh, my people, they fighting a, a different way. Mm -hmm. But now we are fighting with the art with the movie, the territory, the mm -hmm. film that I, I am an executive producer. It's a co-production with the indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's us, it's we, uh, showing 
our reality and talking about our, our I was going there uh, about from our vision, and I think this is uh, this is not only uh, important but it's necessary. And uh, in more than this, we are showing not only uh, our fight, our reality, but we are showing how the Amazon is so beautiful mm -hmm. and how it's so rich and how uh, we have a lot of culture and, and beautiful people there, you know? And now with cameras and, f and cell phones and social media and doing art and doing music and, and now it's us. Mm. We are a population historically in invisible. And, but we say, no more. Mm. You need listeners. And we are sh doing this uh, through the art, the movie. Mm. Thank you. So we're going to show um, their work. Um, and so if you want to introduce the, the film that we're going to see a bit, and then we'll show it and we'll talk about it a little bit afterwards. Sure, this, this film is uh, actually is, is, is such a short film <clears throat> and it's related to, to the thing that I was talking about in the Colombia. In Colombia, there's the Pacific Rainforest and that goes from Panama to Ecuador. And it was one of the most important ecosystems, not in, in Colombia, but in the world. The diversity and the amount of water that we have in the Pacific Rainforest is, is unique the amount of birds, as I was telling. Um, and it's mostly an Africa diaspora territory. Mm -hmm. So music is amazing mm -hmm. there for centuries. And for those centuries, the musicians there, that is mainly marimba music. They have a series of myth myths around the music, mm -hmm. around where the music comes from and everything that actually one of those myths that is the myth of El Duende, that is the title of this short film. El Duende translates to the elf or the dwarf. The myth of El Duende is very similar to the myth of the crossroads here in blues music, mm -hmm. the Robert Johnson and the story. And here in blues music is that the, the guitar player goes to a crossroads and meets with the devil, and the devil teaches him how to play the guitar. So there in the Pacific coast of Colombia, the marimba players go to the jungle. They stay there for a couple of weeks. They drink some biche, that is the local alcohol, and they encounter El Duende. Mm -hmm. And he teaches them to play and to assemble the marimba. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of uh, hallucinating with this history. And we went and filmed the musicians. And I did some remixes of their music. and. Mm -hmm. And the most beautiful thing is that all the profit from the from this soundtrack and from this film is going direct for them. Mm. And it was a beautiful process of encountering on, and knowing how nature inspires music in Colombia mm. and how these communities are so key for the culture of Colombia and for the ecosystems as well. Mm. Okay, so we'll show the film. Yo creo que 
creo que esta es alta marimba es hecha con el duende. Sí. El conejo vive asustado hay veces. Porque el oído como que se lo puso el duende. Él es el que trabaja así. Este hombre es muy curioso. Es muy curioso. <risa> Llorando y pensando. Y gritando música. Una que en el monte, parecido al diablo, pero no es el diablo. El diablo y el duende. El duende resulta de una pata, como decir, de un hueso de, un hueso de muerto. Esa es la historia que yo en lo poquito que he aprendido he escuchado esa cuestión. Pues sí, mi papá aquí vivía tocando todo el tiempo. Construía una marimba y esa marimba era para él repasarla, tocarla y para ver cómo le había quedado. Entonces, ¿qué pasa? Que una tarde tal como hoy estaba, había construido una de 21 tablas. Entonces se puso a tocarla, ¿ya? Y no le llegaba el tono. Entonces, disque se le apareció. No es que disque, sino que se le apareció un amigo. Pero yo digo disque porque yo en ese tiempo estaba pequeñito, ¿ya? Entonces se le apareció ese amigo y que le dijo a mi papá, amigo, ¿usted qué es lo que quiere aprender a tocar? ¿La marimba o hacerla? Le digo, no, mi papá. Me contestó mi papá. Señor, yo quiero aprender, ¿sí? Es hacerla y a tocarla. Pero le dijo, no. No me diga, señor, esos vicios de él. Diga, mi amigo. Preste para acá los tacos. Y mi papá y le pasó los tacos. Bueno, y luego le dijo, cójame el bordón. Yo te voy a coger la requinta. Pero no me diga, no me diga ese vicio que he aprendido. Diga mi amigo. Me voy en principio con la marina. De la tabla pequeña de los pies. Pues si no es en el suelo. De los pies. Ta, 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 ta. Le mira acá el montón. Y cuando le regó la marimba a ese, ese amigo, a mi papá, a mi papá se le cayeron los tacos. En el bajo, en el bordón.
yo mi papá y la marimba que él hizo para sostenerlos a nosotros es esa que está ahí. ¿Ya? Tiene 19 tablas. Pero hizo una de 24 que la puso la marimba de los espíritus. Cuando usted llegaba y pan le daba y eso sonaba, vea. Se iba de aquí a guapo. Allá una parte que le dicen limones. Por acá te muey. Y de ahí para acá mi papá se le voltaron las manos. One of the things I really appreciate about this film is in a, uh, it's both making an argument um, for like conservation or for en environmental justice, but it's doing it in such a provocative, but also through the music, right? So it's doing it through the music. And then we're, we're understanding how these issues around the environment are directly connected to identity, culture, history. And I just wanted you to talk a little bit about how this approach allows you to, like why you find this approach effective, because it's music, film, and then you also have all of these various politics around it. So I was just curious about this approach for you. Yeah, well, f first of all, you can watch it, uh, the whole piece in YouTube, no? <laughs> still, still do I have to see the ending, no? Yes, I saw uh, that, I got to see the ending. It's an expert, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think what's interesting about this meeting of, of languages around activism and environment and politics is that I think art has this unique tool to engage, and especially music, has this unique tool to engage people through emotions into the conversation. Because I think what has been happening up to up till today with the old environmental scientific politics the speech around the environment is that it doesn't engage people and people aren't anymore engaged by politics because politics are failing today in the world. Mm. So I think music engages through emotions and connects with people and makes people understand that beyond music there's a whole context of, of things happening mm. that, that they can be aware of, mm -hmm. and especially in Colombia. No? You introduce the context through music mm. And if people get interested, they can go and beyond that and find out that the ecosystems that, that are in the Pacific rainforest are amazing ecosystems that are really threatened by many, many problems, and that the political situation of the territory is also very difficult because they have been isolated communities from centuries and centuries. But do you have to tell that story through music in my way, mm -hmm. in my way of seeing? And that's a way to engage the general public even more mm. than a politician mm -hmm. saying this or the other. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's what are we trying to do? Mm -hmm. That's what are we trying to do? And hopefully we'll get some changes or I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think we'll talk more about this um, as we continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Zoraida, we, are, we, we saw visual images, moving uh, visual images in the film and, and music. And now we're shifting to photography, though your practice is photography and, and, and many other uh, mediums as well. Can we talk a bit about uh, your work? Um, and I think we're going to pull up uh, some of your images now. Um, so if you want to talk about the intersection sure. of art and how you, you know, the, the ways in which this particular practice of yours uh, connects to these issues. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you to Isela Misha and to New York Times and everyone who is here. So when I thought about the topic and I started preparing some images, I thought about how my work is really um, rooted in listening, creativity, and Simone is right, like how do we engage people and how do we move into a collective action? So um, one of those ways is um, I work in the land conservation movement and I found when I first joined that there were so few people of color in the room um, who were able to make decisions about the places that they lived. And many of these places were being affected by um, climate change. And we weren't a part of the conversations and we weren't decision makers. And so I co-founded um, a national platform and affinity group for people of color in the conservation movement. So um, here is 
this is pre-COVID at the Land Trust um, National Conference called Rally, um, speaking at our first meeting, and we have over 200 members and allies right now um, all over the country. Um, next slide. And so um, this idea of moving into collective action can be seen here um, through one of my projects. Um, focused on building a community garden um, with Scenic Hudson, City of Poughkeepsie, and multiple community members and partners. And this block, it's this uh, small block called Pershing Avenue in Poughkeepsie. It's a formerly redlined block. It intersects with a block that was destroyed by urban renewal. There's public housing behind. Um, a church in the front, and this is a public park that kind of this back lot that was filled uh, when I first visited it, it had like needles, tires, um, small bonfires, and um, mattresses, and we listened to community, and several people said they wanted a community garden, and um, the community garden, if you go to the next slide, the community garden now has um, 22 garden beds. It's hyper-local. Everyone lives within walking distance. An urban farmer who lives three blocks away. It's producing over, um, it's gonna produce over a thousand pounds of food this year just on the urban, um, the urban farm side. But it, to me, this is really an example of how a community garden and urban farm can serve as a community monument, a site of healing, um, a site of um, spiritual healing, mental health, and um, physical uh, healing through eating good food. And when we talk about you know, the cities that we're all working in, Poughkeepsie is a place where minimum 30% of people don't have cars. One in four kids suffers from childhood obesity. Um, and the nearest grocery store, it's a 32 minute bus ride. So this idea of art intersecting, intersecting with environmental justice has kind of really critical firsthand impacts for um, people on the ground. Um, next slide. And I think about the idea of placemaking in my own work and where I grew up. So I grew up in Connecticut, but I grew up a stone's throw away from these huge tobacco fields. And when people think of Connecticut, they don't really think about tobacco fields. Um, but Connecticut has a, a huge multi-million dollar industry around shade tobacco. And um, that's, those are the tobacco leaves that are used to roll cigars. And uh, so many folks of color come from other countries and they end up working on these farms under these shaded tobacco um, uh, kind of tense, and because of climate change, I mean, the conditions are even worse. Um, the tobacco plants are sprayed, and then people have to go in right after and um, pick tobacco. And what's even more interesting is right behind these tobacco fields is a new Amazon warehouse. Um, next slide. And so when it comes into my um, curation work, uh, I, like, I think a lot about kind of what's being overlooked and who is being overlooked within um, conversations and in different arenas. And most recently, I co-curated um, Picturing Black Girlhood, an exhibition that was at Express Newark. Um, and it focused on black girls and um, black women and genderqueer artists. Um, and it was the largest exhibit around black girlhood that has ever occurred. If you go to the next slide, you'll see one of the key rooms in the exhibit was called our Utopia Room. And we wanted to think about kind of a space where black girls could just feel free, free to be themselves and um, connect to nature in a sense, but uh, in the indoors. And then if you go to the next slide, you'll see this space was highly used during the exhibition. Um, tons of girls would spend time in the space. 
The chairs were also made by um, an artist, Kim Hill. Um, the photograph behind was made by an artist, Nadia Blas, but the chairs would be moved around. Um, and it was, it just really felt like a space where people could be free and feel free. Um, next slide. And this idea of um, what is being overlooked comes through in my photography practice. So often when we talk about food security, food insecurity and food systems, we, it feels like we often forget the actual workers that are cultivating and harvesting the food. And um, for some time I've been photographing undocumented farmers in upstate New York who are uh, picking the food that we eat every day. And here's um, a farmer on a large onion farm um, in upstate New York. Um, they work incredible long hours. Uh, up until pretty recently, farm workers were not given a day off. It, it wasn't in state legislation. Um, there was over a 200 mile walk from Long Island to Albany um, in protest against, um, against this. And then if you go to the next slide. And then within that, you know, I think it's important to think when we're talking about anyone, everyone has a family. So how are families impacted by this? Um, for a while, I was documenting where children sleep. So where children of undocumented farm workers sleep. Uh, what do their rooms look like? And what are their hopes and their dreams that they have in these spaces? Some of my current projects include, um, I'm co-editing a book right now, um, Black Matrilineage, Photography and Representation, Another Way of Knowing, and it's a collection of academic essays and curated images around black mothering and motherhood, and some of that includes the connection that black women have to the land. And, um, Another project focuses on street trees and the legacy of trees in urban communities. Again, so many trees in our cities were cut down during urban renewal. And what does it mean to put trees back into communities? And um, who is doing it? And um, who has uh, the ownership of the trees? It's kind of all tied to the history of cities and uh, urban planning. And then the last slide, I don't know if you can see a video. And so now I've started making cyanotypes around trees, thinking about that history of trees in America, um, land in America, and how um, it's increasingly complicated, um, but interesting to look at those complexities and what they reveal. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, Chai, you're the executive producer of the film Territory, and Territory uh, is a Times Critics' Choice uh, film that follows the fight of the indigenous Ruwawo, uh, Ruwawo, or I almost got it, Ruwawo people <laughs> against the encroaching deforestation brought by farmers and illegal settlers. Um, in the Brazilian Amazon. So first of all, thank you for being here. I know you've been traveling uh, many places. Um, but, you know, uh, I was able to see uh, part of the film today and I was just really, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful film and it's such an important film. It's so urgent. But why a film at this moment? And you, you talked about this a little bit about visibility and invisibility. So if you could just talk a little bit more about why a film um, maybe helps us see uh, the issue differently. Um, the Amazon is so far uh, from here and you don't know uh, about the Amazon, you don't know about the indigenous peoples or what's going there and we, and the Amazon is uh, essential to the world because we are talking about the climate change 
So if we lost the Amazon, uh, we lost our future. Yeah. And it's important you know about that. It's important you uh, speak about the Amazon and, and you know who is fighting there mm. for, for support uh, this planet mm. that us. Mm. And it, you know, I'm an executive producer and the first time that the people uh, know me, they never say that. They never say, oh, I think you are a producer of the film. No, they always think that I'm in the film. Mm -hmm. Because it's not the, the first thing, mm. it's how they are doing mm. this. They are doing, they are te telling our, uh, our own, own stories. Mm. No, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, and this is, we need to do this, mm. you know? Mm. Because who, uh, know more who can uh, speak better about the forest than us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and we are, uh, we are doing, we did this, uh, this incredible film mm -hmm. uh, that I inviting uh, everybody that are, are here to go to the, the, the theaters and uh, see. Um, it, it, and it's a documentary, mm. it, and you know when the peop the people uh, stop uh, when the the film ended the, and the people come talk with us. Sometimes that yeah, but this is real mm. because it's so uh, incredible what's going there that the people don't believe. So we are sh in we are in the climate week. We are talking about that and Brazil is the, I don't know how to say this word in English, <laughs> quarto? Fourth. 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 The fourth country uh, that uh, it's the most pollution in the world because of the, the deforestation. Mm -hmm. And this uh, is not affecting only us, but will affect you mm -hmm. too. And the climate change, it, this is uh, happening right now. We are suffering right now. And mainly we, the indigenous peoples, the black people, the poor people. Uh, so we need to bring uh, this issue to here mm -hmm. too to all the world, and all the world need to talk about that. Mm. Uh, and yeah, so please go to the cinema, see our film, talk about the Amazon, talk about the indigenous peoples, listen to us, and. So we're gonna show a brief uh, clip of the film right now as well.
Um, so I guess I want to ask all of you a question that I think the work that you've all shown us um, presents to us. The relationship between the local and the global, right? So there are films like, I think it's called, I watched it, Don't Look Up, right? A film that shows what's happening, um, a global catastrophe. And then there are the works that you do that help us zone in on particular communities or particular people that also speak to the large, larger crisis. And I was just wondering about the strategy, um, because I find, like you said before, it's uh, the emotional aspects or the historical aspects are so present in your work. Um, so it's a question, again, about like effectiveness, maybe. Um, I do a lot of work around issues that are people historically haven't wanted to talk about around uh, gender-based violence. And using the arts to do that has, has helps. Or I, my research is on civil rights movement and the way people use art to kind of convince people to make change. Um, my question for you is, how is focusing on local communities, what we think of as the local, but not necessarily, you know, the local um, help us understand these big issues? Like, what, what does it tap into? that I think, and you alluded to this earlier, like sometimes the scientific discourse doesn't quite make people move or even the big political conversations aren't getting people to act, but we know art can move people, um, can bring in people to difficult conversations and then also create another world. So I guess the importance of art in this movement, but doing it in a local, local, Way anyone can answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I th I think that um, in 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 nature, that is what, what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. No, the nature and e ecosystems and territories is kind of how von Humboldt saw the ecosystems of the world. Mm -hmm. Everything is connected. Yeah. So what happens locally and specifically in one territory as important as the Amazon jungle, for example, mm -hmm. it affects uh, globally. Mm -hmm. It affects all the planet, no? Mm -hmm. And people sometimes are not aware of that situation, mm. of how important is the Amazon, because usually you speak about the Amazon of the lung of the planet, but it's actually a water pump of the planet that it affects all water cycles in all the Americas, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. no? So everything is connected. And a small local community in the Amazon jungle or in the Pacific rainforest, the indigenous or Afro, that are protecting a small piece of territory in the whole planet are doing a huge work mm -hmm. for all humanity. Mm -hmm. And people sometimes don't realize that that small effort is a huge effort, mm -hmm. especially in those kind of places. Mm -hmm. And then, and then culture and music is also a, a, like a, a, a huge way of, of communicating and making specific languages in places global at the same time. Mm. Because the, the issues that happen in the small indigenous communities are issues that affect everything, no? Mm. And the music that is being made in those places it's a music that is for the world as well. No? Mm. So connecting those dots in the ecosystems around the planet and being aware that that small place is affecting me and it's affecting you and it's affecting everyone is kind of the way to go to understand 
even how nature works as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think this, um, this approach of being super kind of hyper-local, to me, sometimes I think about these as kind of pilots. Like, how can some of these projects either um, inspire others? So when black girls and gender queer youth went to picturing black girlhood and they sat in that this space where they could feel as if they were outdoors in nature and feel free what is that going to kind of catalyze in their mind to go out and actually make their physical world reflect the the openness that they that they felt in express newark um, in, in, in an art space. And I think about, you know, how do, how do I, on this very kind of small scale, create moments that can be replicated? How can like this community garden in Poughkeepsie be replicated in other cities that are, I mean, so many cities are facing similar issues all over the world. How can, how can these projects be replicated? what can be shared, what needs to change to fit different places. And I think you can only start to really tap into that creativity if you do it on this hyper-local scale. I agree with you. Uh, I believe that all is connected. We are connected with this planet, with the, with the forest. And, and I, and when we talk about climate change, I believe that we will win uh, with uh, local fights. Mm. It's a global global um, thing, but we will uh, with this, uh, all these fights that are uh, happening in different places. And, and, uh, and we are bringing uh, a local fight that is the same uh, in other place because mm. I meet the Maori people and I realize that, yeah, we are, uh, uh, we are feeling the same, we are fighting to the, the same things, yeah. and, but in different places. Mm -hmm. and we, uh, we are connected too because we are uh, indigenous peoples and I think uh, two ways and two things. Bring this local fight to here, to, a, uh, to, to the global, and bring the global to there. Mm. Because our film is uh, more than a, a film to us. We, uh, with this, we, we want to start this conversation about the climate change, supply chain, deforestation free, human rights, indigenous peoples, yeah. but more than this, you can go to our, our website that we have a big impact campaign and you can know more about uh, our work and you can uh, support us too. So we are uh, bring the global to there, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to open it up to the audience. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, OK, so I think I see a hand here. Hi. I just had a question about um, how you view objectivity and subjectivity. Because I think that, especially over the last couple of years, um, we've become very obsessed with statistics and science and the 1.5 degrees, et cetera, et cetera. But I often think that it's not necessarily um, what we see, but how we see it. And not what we say, but how we say it. And so how do you think that the subjectivity can actually be leveraged in order to really um, get us to where we need to be? OK. Cadê o meu marido? Um, is, uh, how to leverage, um, can I rephrase it a bit? Uh, personal. I'm learning, sorry. Oh, no, no. It's so sometimes I need help, you yeah. know? <laughs> I think um, the way I understood it is that there's like the data, and then there's what I understand from the work that you're doing is 
almost storytelling, personal stories, personal narratives. And how is that, in a way, differently, more effective or, or more useful, maybe, or helpful in this? I'm rephrasing it, but I think when you say subjectivity versus objectivity, that's what I got. So how does personal storytelling, uh, personal stories help in a way that maybe just the raw numbers about what's happening doesn't? It's for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if I understand. Okay. But if it, I don't understand, we can talk uh, after. <laughs> and I can't answer you. Uh, <laughs> you know, everybody's learning. <laughs> well, that in your film, yes. you, have, uh, you, you tell the story of two people. And that uh, helps us understand what's happening versus just like the number, like, yeah, the numbers of Hablar en mi español, no sé si así. Él estaba preguntando sobre hay información y hay números y hay data y podemos explicar, explicar, explicar con números y data. Pero también hay historias y hay um, sentimientos y cómo podemos hablar sobre estos problemas con las historias y... No, I get it. <laughs> okay. Now I get it. Yeah, thank okay. you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so uh, I think the power that the cinema, the movies, is touch. Touch here in the heart. You know, I can say to you that uh, in, this is real. Uh, now in Brazil, we have the worst uh, highest uh, percent of the deforestation, but uh, this is not, not will teach you, touch you. But you know, our film uh, show the murder of a friend of mine because uh, he was a guardian of the forest. And I think this touch more <laughs> because, uh, you know, we are people. We crying, we are learning, we are, mm. we, uh, we be happy, we be sad, we uh, make mistakes, we, mm. you know, and sometimes I think you don't realize that when we talk about the Amazon, the forest, the deforestation. And I think uh, bring this story, these real stories uh, is more strong. And, and you know, this, uh, the, the film talk about my mother, my family, my people, and all that we believe, you know, all, all this connection that I say to you. And I think this is, this is more strong. Uh, but yeah, but I, I, I can say to you a lot of numbers about the, the, uh, a lot of uh, things that going there, but uh, it's not so strong how you see. And yeah, you, you, you understand and you feel, you know. I think that the people need to feel and some people, uh, they don't are doing sometimes enough because uh, they don't feel yet that the consequence, the climate change, and that always it's happening uh, right now. Mm. And I think the storytelling is important, it's so important because that. And yeah, we need, we need real story and incredible stories, the real heroes. Thank you. Yeah, I, was, I want to, to say something also. For example, in Colombia today is the number one country where they kill social and environmental leaders in the world. And for example, it's different if you say so many people are like a number. If you say numbers, it enters through the head. 
But if you go behind the stories of the people mm -hmm. that are in the territories, uh, that are people, and as you say, have feelings that are connected to the land and are doing a tremendous, tremendous job to protect pristine territories and everything, and you connect with their hearts, it's different. Mm -hmm. Your heart connect, connects with that heart, and you don't connect with a number. That is what's happening usually around the environmental, these numbers. And it has become a thing about numbers, not about people and about nature that is a living being as well. You know? So if, we, if hearts are connected as well as nature is connected, maybe things start to change as well. Mm -hmm. um, numbers and not nature, not culture, not languages. It's an interesting uh, way in which the, the data becomes the way in which we are supposed to enter this. Um, versus all the other tools that we have and points of connection. So thank you. Um, I think we have one more question. I, I feel like someone has a microphone. If not, oh, okay. I think. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> hi. Can you hear me? Oh, hello. Yes. Um, hi, my name's Kate. I am also an artist and an activist, and I just want to say thank you. You are giving me... Um, life and energy and making me feel like it's possible to keep going. So thank you so much for that and for your work. Um, a friend recently said to me that the climate crisis is not a crisis of science, it's a crisis of spirit. And I often think of myself as working in the, the medium of spirit. And if you also feel that you are doing that work, I wonder what is the thing that you are trying to reconcile spiritually within yourself? what is the thing that is keeping you up um, that you're working on personally? Thank you. That's a big. <laughs> <laughs> how, so, how much time do I know? I, I would say have, uh, four minutes. I have a one group. year old that's keeping me up, <laughs> yeah. but I don't think that's uh, the answer that, that you are thinking of. You know, history, um, history keeps me up and how history has affected um, our current situ I mean our current situation like when I think of land and I think of trees and I think of lynchings that happen on trees and the only one of the only recorded cases of lynchings in New York State happened to a black woman and I you know I think about that and I think about I think about how trees were taken down in black communities all over this country and what does that mean for like urban heat islands? And how do you show that in a way that isn't, you know, these like maps with colors that is kind of that data that feels so separate and doesn't get to the, um, doesn't get to that like uh, connection that kind of stings, you know, stings someone and, and, um, and uh, punctures them. And so I think, um, I think quite a bit about that. Um, and I, I always think about in the work that I make, how do I make sure that the people I'm working with are the first ones that see the work? So whether I'm working in like a prison or a street tree project, the first show that I have, it's it's for that community. They get prints of their work. You know, it's, it's not extractive because I think going in this line of data, um, it can, you know, it can be, you have environmental extraction, but it can be extracting of, of people in a different way too. And how do I just make sure that I'm just not moving in that direction either? Second? Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, you know, my hope is come from here and of course come from the other people that, uh, from my people, from the forest and from the people that are doing, not only complain, you know, not, we are not only complain, but we are doing, we are really, uh, building a better world. My hope is from Alex, uh, my director, that 
did this amazing film with me, Gabriel, the producer, uh, the film, and my husband too. So it's from my family, it's from my fight, because I'm not here to say about, yeah, uh, you know, the world will, is the end of the world, but I'm here to show you that, yeah, are, are, are people that are fighting against this. And of course, uh, we cannot wait anymore because maybe so late, <laughs> but we can uh, do a better word to the people that are fighting, you know? And yeah, so my hope is in, I, I cannot uh, give up because this is means um, forgot all the, the, the resistance and all the fight, the, my ancestors and my people. Yeah. You, <laughs> you had. Yeah, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> for me, for me, it's about, I think it's about, about connection, about, because we as white people, I feel that they teach us and we've grown in a civilization and everything that has been disconnected from nature. Mm. So I wake up every day and try to reconnect even more with nature because when you reconnect with nature, you reconnect with, with people and you, and you feel that you're part of, of a bigger ecosystem where every, everything is dependent on the other and on nature as well. And, uh, and when you reconnect, you start feeling the importance and you start perceiving nature not as a thing that is there for our use, but as like a, a mother really, or, or, a, or some parenthood between nature and ourselves. And for me, that's the inspiration of, of art and has been the inspiration for art forever, rebuilding those lost connections that indigenous people have because they live in those places and, and we have to build bridges with those communities and learn from that knowledge that they for centuries have been living in harmony with nature mm. and we forgot to do it. Mm. So I, I try to wake up every day and just listen to the birds and start from there <laughs> <laughs> up and then do art, mm. whatever. I would like to thank you all for this really important and invigorating conversation. Um, and thank you all for your questions and for being present with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And I'm going to ask our final panel just to remain seated while I just make some closing remarks. Salamisha, thank you so much. Tremendous panel. Thank you to all of you. Uh, for an inspiring last session to what has been, I think, a really provocative day. Um, I'm David Gellis. I'm one of the correspondents on the Climate Desk, which is a, a fast-growing part of the New York Times newsroom. And it represents uh, our institution's commitment to documenting what, what I, I think I can speak for the paper. Uh, it, we believe that this is just one of the most seminal enduring stories, not only of our lifetimes, but of future lifetimes as well. Uh, and the diversity of perspectives we had on stage, on this very stage today, I think represents our commitment to understanding all sides of the issue. We heard from statesmen and former statesmen, including former Vice President Al Gore, who kicked us off with, I think, a framing that is really useful. And he said something to the effect of, climate activism is the antidote to climate angst. You know, so many of us are wondering what we can do, and the answer, as we heard over and over on stage, is that we take action. We take action through the arts, through politics, and more. As the day went on, we heard from representatives of the food industry, uh, those working in energy sectors, those working for energy ministers, uh, and from prime ministers themselves. Uh, this afternoon, I interviewed both the heads of the IMF, the World Bank, as well as the Prime Minister of the Bahamas, and it was rather extraordinary to hear that the president of the World Bank would not, on the record, acknowledge the scientific consensus of climate change. I leave that with you, but those are the kind of conversations that only happen when we actually get together on stage, and it's the kind of work that we do in the paper and online every day. So I thank you all for being with us. 
I invite you to stay up to date with the paper uh, through our digital and print platforms, of course, and specifically with the climate team's coverage through our Climate Forward newsletter. I also hope you can join us in person or virtually at our next live event in San Francisco next month on October 12th, where I'll be doing a series of interviews, including interviewing Laureen Powell Jobs and John Doerr, the venture capitalist, about their climate philanthropy. And we've got another tremendous set of speakers. And also, the month after that, in Sharm el-Sheikh at COP, where the New York Times will have three full days of programming building on this tremendous series of conversations we've been having around the world on what, again, is, we believe, one of the most important issues of our day. So thank you to our final panelists. Thank you to all of those in the room and online. I bid you a good climate week in New York. Goodbye. Thank you.